Decision time. South Korea's top national security officials are reportedly set to decide whether to pull Seoul out of its intel sharing pact with Tokyo. This is South Korea Japan talks over their trade dispute crumble within 35 minutes. Samsung to feel the heat. It's too early to tell. But President Trump says Apple's CEO made a good case that U.S. tariffs on China are making it difficult for Apple to compete with rivals like Samsung. Plus, could a friction-free Brexit happen after all? Germany's leader says conversations about the Irish backstop can begin. Angela Merkel tells her British counterpart that a solution could be reached in just one month. Our top story this morning, South Korea's presidential office is reportedly set to discuss whether to renew or withdraw from the intelligence sharing agreement with Japan. And this is going to happen during a National Security Council meeting this Thursday, in the coming hours, in fact. The General Security of Military Information Agreement or GISOMIA, as it is commonly known, is due for renewal by Saturday. President Moon Jae-in is likely to approve the council's decision, regardless of whether it decides to renew or withdraw. Sources say the decision could be announced as soon as today as well. If neither South Korea nor Japan declare their withdrawal by Saturday, the 90-day notice deadline, the pact is automatically renewed for another year. South Korea has dangled the idea of possibly leaving the pact since Japan accused Seoul of illegally transferring chemical materials to North Korea, one of the reasons Tokyo gave for imposing export curbs on South Korea. The top diplomats of South Korea and Japan met in Beijing on Wednesday for a high-stakes meeting with the ongoing trade spat still raging between the two nations. However, and as many expected, nothing much had changed since they last met face-to-face -face three weeks ago in Thailand. The meeting started and ended in just over half an hour with no progress made. And that leaves everyone asking, what's next? EG1 reports. South Korea's Foreign Affairs Minister Kang kyung hwa and her Japanese counterpart Taro Kono met again Wednesday afternoon to discuss pending issues. But it seems like they simply reiterated their stances, neither side budging. The 35-minute meeting came on the sidelines of the 9th Seoul-Beijing-Tokyo Foreign Affairs Minister's talks. According to an official at South Korea's foreign ministry, Minister Kang, as expected, expressed great regret over Japan's trade restrictions on Seoul and urged Tokyo to retract them. She also said that there need to be negotiations on the matter and asked for Japan's efforts there. But to that, Kono is said to have restated the view that the restrictions are not up for discussion because they were imposed for security reasons. The South Korean official told reporters that Kono also brought up the forced labor ruling in which Seoul's Supreme Court ordered Japanese firms to compensate the Koreans forced to work for them during Japan's colonial rule. Kono reportedly argued that the issue was resolved in their normalization agreement in 1965, while Kang is to have said that the government respects the judicial authority of the court. As for South Korea sharing military intel with Japan, Kono reportedly asked for Seoul to make a decision on whether to continue. The deadline for either side to cancel it is this Saturday, but Kang said the matter is still under review. South Korean officials have wondered aloud why they should keep sharing military intel with Japan if, as Kono says, there are security issues between the two sides. There have been reports that a decision will be made at the weekly National Security Council meeting on Thursday. And with so much emotion on both sides, the ministers asked each other to protect the safety of their people in each other's countries as well. Meanwhile, Kang is also to have again relayed Seoul's grave concerns about Japan's treatment of radioactive water in Fukushima, while urging Japan to make a wise decision. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. 
Now, radiation concerns are back in the spotlight here in South Korea due to Japan's reported plan to discharge hundreds of thousands of tons of highly contaminated water from its Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. And a local activist is warning strongly against such an option even being considered for a second by Tokyo. Yoon Jong-min reports. Amid reports that Japan is planning on dumping more than 1 million tons of radioactive wastewater into the Pacific Ocean, an official at Greenpeace Seoul raised concerns over the potential damage such action may cause to the Pacific ecosystem and neighboring countries. I mean, Pacific Ocean, it's, it is an enormous body of the water. So once you discharge the water, which should not be so happen in the future, but once it you know, discharges, uh, it disperses into, you know, ocean currents. So it's very clear that once the water get out from the reactors, it will definitely affect to the ocean. When asked about how South Korea, one of Japan's closest neighbors, can do to prevent Tokyo from releasing the wastewater into the ocean, Chang said Seoul can raise the issue to the international community as the risks of contamination concerns to all nations on the Pacific Rim. They can speak out about this problem, I mean, towards this whole, um, whole world. Basically, um, such uh, international organization like IMO, International Marine Time Organization, and there are also meetings coming up uh, in this year, IAEA, and also UN uh, meetings as well. I mean, there are plenty of opportunity for Korean government to uh, raise these issues to the international society. Japan's plan to contaminate the Pacific Ocean with radioactive water is also raising concerns over the safety of everyone slated to be part of the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, including athletes, organizers and visitors. Chang said there is still time to raise the issue directly with the Japanese government. Chang said dumping wastewater into the ocean can't be an option. Greenpeace advises Japan to have a long-term storage plan until they develop the adequate technology to completely remove all traces of radioactivity from the contaminated water. Yoon Jong-min, Arirang News. Now, shifting gears, U.S. Special Representative for North Korea Stephen Began says Washington is ready to hold talks with North Korea if the regime is up for it. His remarks came during a meeting on Wednesday with his South Korean counterpart and Seoul's unification minister. Began also downplayed recent speculation that President Trump was planning to nominate him as the next U.S. ambassador to Russia. Oh Jung-hee reports. Washington is prepared to start talks as soon as the North is ready. That's according to U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began, speaking to reporters Wednesday at Seoul's Foreign Ministry after meeting his South Korean counterpart, Lee Do-hoon. Began said he was assigned by President Trump two months ago to resume working-level negotiations with Pyongyang after the Kim-Trump meeting at the demilitarized zone. Began stressed that he's fully committed to this task. Regarding the restart of those negotiations, we are prepared to engage as soon as we hear from our counterparts in North Korea. He then denied recent rumors that he'd be leaving his post and become U.S. ambassador to Moscow. I want to dispel any rumors that I will be leaving this portfolio to take up an ambassadorship abroad. I will not be taking up a diplomatic posting in the Russian Federation, and I will remain focused on making progress on North Korea. Meeting at the inter-Korean truce village of Panmunjom in late June, Kim Jong-un and President Trump had promised to resume working-level talks in two or three weeks. But the North did not respond to U.S. proposals, and so that didn't come true. Soon after, Pyongyang started condemning Seoul and Washington for holding a joint military exercise. But with the drills having ended on Tuesday, it is possible that North Korea and the U.S. could meet soon. Two weeks ago, Kim Jong-un wrote to President Trump that he'd like to start negotiations as soon as the drills are over. 
Later on Wednesday, Began met with Seoul's Unification Minister Kim yeon chul as well. He'll wrap up his visit on Thursday after meeting with the Deputy Chief of South Korea's National Security Council, Kim hyun jong Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. Now, following on from that report, the U.S. State Department has confirmed there are no additional meetings or visits to announce for U.S. Special Representative for North Korea, Stephen Began, for the re remainder of his time here in South Korea. The statement comes as there had been uh, swirling speculation about a possible meeting with North Korean officials during Began's stay in the South. He is due to leave Seoul sometime on this Thursday. North Korea and the U.S. agreed in June to restart working level talks, but they have yet to take place due to renewed tensions on the Korean Peninsula. A U.S.-based think tank says recent satellite images show one of the two uranium enrichment plants in North Korea isn't showing any sign of new activity. According to the Center for Strategic and International Studies on Wednesday, the Pakchon plant was highly active until the mid-1990s, but has since gone pretty much dark and is currently being maintained with no major changes or obvious activities going on. However, experts say that because no international inspections have been conducted on the site for more than 25 years, a thorough check would be necessary for a denuclearization agreement to be reached between the North and the U.S. U.S. President Donald Trump has vowed to help Apple in its corporate rivalry with South Korean tech giant Samsung Electronics. The latest comments come as Trump told reporters last weekend that Apple CEO Tim Cook expressed concerns to him personally about the impact U.S. tariffs on Chinese goods are having on his company's uh, products. Because, as we know, uh, a vast majority of Apple uh, products are made in China. Lee Sung Jae has this report. Speaking to reporters at the White House on Wednesday, U.S. President Donald Trump reiterated he'll help Apple short-term, highlighting the issue of the American company having to pay hefty U.S. tariffs while Samsung does not. His latest reference to the two tech giants comes a matter of days after Trump told reporters that Apple CEO Tim Cook recently expressed his concerns over the Trump administration's tariffs on China. And Tim was talking to me about tariffs. And, you know, one of the things, and he made a good case, is that Samsung is their number one competitor, and Samsung is not paying tariffs because they're based in South Korea. And it's tough for Apple to pay tariffs if they're competing with a very good company that's not. I While the Trump administration initially planned to impose an additional 10 percent tariff on $300 billion worth of Chinese goods starting next month, it recently postponed extra tariffs on consumer goods like cell phones and laptops until mid-December. Meanwhile, Apple, which is looking to slash its reliance on Samsung's display technology, is reportedly in the final stages of certifying advanced screens from top Chinese display maker BOE Technology Group for its next generation of iPhones. Observers say the entry of BOE could threaten the South Korean company's dominating position in the display industry and give Apple more leverage to squeeze price cuts out of Samsung. The iPhone maker currently buys OLEDs from Samsung Electronics, which dominates the global premium screen market with a more than 90 percent share. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. The number of foreign tourists visiting South Korea has doubled in the past decade and young female tourists from Asia have led the trend. According to recent data by the Korea Culture and Tourism Institute, female tourists in their 20s and 30s from China, Japan and Taiwan have increased significantly over the past 10 years. Women made up 59 percent of all tourists from China last year, rising five percentage points over the past decade. 63 percent of tourists from Japan and 67 percent from Taiwan are also women. For all three countries, tourists in their 20s and 30s were the largest age group. An official from the Institute says the popularity of K-pop and K-beauty seems to be driving the trend. 
Now, South Korea has long been regarded as a country that creates entertaining content that's loved by viewers around the world. And this week, Seoul is hosting its biggest broadcast contents market to introduce the latest TV shows, movies and games to prospective domestic and international buyers. Lee Min Sun reports. Broadcast worldwide, or PCWW, Korea's biggest content market for international broadcasting networks and buyers opened in southern Seoul on Wednesday. 170 companies from 40 countries, including China, Japan, Turkey, and the U.S., are taking part at this year's event. It's an opportunity for content creators to get their latest work in the spotlight. While previous events mainly focused on television dramas, this year the organizers tried to expand their scope and introduce other popular programs like variety and entertainment shows to foreign broadcast companies. The organizers also hope to highlight the potential of licensing content for other formats like cartoons. I'm doing a kind of research about K-pop and I'm here uh, to, to find some kind of content that explain the phenomenon of K-pop because I'd like to apply uh, what Korean made with his music in Brazil. Arirang TV makes a range of programs including news, documentaries, lifestyle shows and K-pop shows. Our most popular programs are K-pop programs such as Simply K-pop and After School Club. This year, we are also presenting high-quality online cooking content and tour programs. Arirang TV has also invited 16 producers from Chinese media outlets for a regular two-week cooperative program to create content together and promote Korean programs to a broader market. The annual event also gives participants the chance to take a closer look at the future of content for broadcast and new media. Experts give presentations about the evolution of content and platforms amid changes in technology like the 5G network. This year's event is also providing more public-friendly events like fan meetings with webtoonists, documentary film screenings, and lectures by a popular digital content creator. PCWW runs till Friday at COEX in Seoul. Im in Sun, Arirang News. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is on his first overseas trip since becoming leader of the UK in Berlin on Wednesday. Johnson reiterated his call to German Chancellor Angela Merkel for the Irish border backstop plan to be scrapped. For more on this and other news from around the world, let's turn to our Kim Dami. So Dami, uh, tell us more about these talks in Germany. Right, Mark. A British Prime Minister Boris Johnson once again said his country wants the Irish border backstop removed to smooth the road for a less bumpy Brexit. He made the remarks during a press conference Wednesday with German Chancellor Angela Merkel in Berlin. Johnson has long insisted the Irish border backstop must be axed to prevent a no-deal exit, calling it undemocratic. He also said all his German friends and the German government know that the UK wants a Brexit deal with the EU. But Merkel told Johnson that he needed to come up with specific proposals on alternatives to the backstop. It has been said, oh, we will find a solution in the next two years, but maybe we can find one in the next 30 days. She added with the, the withdrawal agreement will not be reopened, Johnson responded that he welcomed the blistering timetable. And according to the French government, the UK is expected to leave the EU without a withdrawal agreement. This means a so-called no-deal Brexit is now considered the most likely outcome in France. Johnson will meet French President Emmanuel Macron on Thursday for further discussions on Brexit. Now to an update on the British government worker in Hong Kong who went missing earlier this month during a trip to China. According to China's foreign ministry on Wednesday, Simon Cheng has been detained in Shenzhen for 15 days after allegedly violating a, a law on public order. Reason for his arrest is still unknown. The ministry added his arrest was not a diplomatic issue. 
It also issued a warning to British officials, stop meddling in Hong Kong affairs. No single-use plastic will be allowed around Mount Everest in a bid to cut down on waste left by climbers. Nepalese, Nepalese authorities announced the new rules on Wednesday. They said it will keep the region, Everest, and nearby mountains clean long term. The ban will take effect next year, as yet no penalties have been announced for climbers violating the rule. Authorities recently cleared 11 tons of garbage from the world's highest mountain. It is time now for our Life and Info segment where we focus on information that we do hope will be useful for your everyday life. Today we're going to focus on a leisure related activity, namely a new virtual reality experience that you can try out here in South Korea. I'm happy to say we have our Kan Hyung Yu in the studio to tell us more about it. So Hyung Yu, uh, fill us in on this new era of VR. So Mark, uh, this is a new type of VR where you can actually touch and feel everything you see in the virtual world. Mm. So if there's a door in front of you in the virtual world, it means that a real door exists in front of you in the exact same spot in the real world. Okay. If this doesn't make sense, it's better to see what it is to understand what I'm trying to describe. So let's look at the video first. So now, this is the newly opened Nomadic VR Arcade at CGV Gangbyeon, a local theater near Dongseol bus terminal. Up to four people can play the shooting game at the same time to fight zombies and try to save the world. So each person gets a rifle which actually vibrates every time you fire, and this gives players the real feeling of shooting. I felt like I was actually in The Walking Dead and that I was the main character, which was awesome. This was also my first time trying VR that I could touch. It was an incredible and fresh experience. Now, if you see the video right now, they opened the door in the virtual world, and uh, you're going to see in a second that's what they're seeing in the gameplay. Right. So there are objects in the game, uh, there are doors, buttons, levers, drawers, and other many objects that players can actually, you know, push and pull. Are there actually people dressed up as zombies in there or not? No, they're not in the arcade, but you can see uh, in the virtual right, world right, that right. Uh, zombies are coming to you and you're trying to shoot them down as you try to save the world. Yeah. So uh, right now you're, you're seeing that uh, they're going through a stage where the st plot line is basically you're trying to save the world by finding a cure vaccine yeah. to uh, save the zombies. Yeah. So if you, are, uh, if you succeed at doing that, uh, I think there's a reward at the end of the game, mm. but I'm not supposed to tell because okay. I don't want to give spoilers. Well, how much does it cost per person, roughly? Right now, they're on sale. Uh, per person, it's about seven US dollars, and the whole thing lasts about 20 minutes. Okay, it's reasonable. So this type of combination between virtual and physical reality, it like tricks your mind into thinking that you're actually there. Mm. But this isn't the end at all. It's just the beginning. Developers say they're thinking bigger. So hopefully in the future, in the near future, in fact, uh, we expect people to perhaps come see a superhero movie here in CGV and then come to a place like here and actually go into the movie and meet the heroes that you just met and be one of them. Okay, it sounds fantastic. So you can actually play your favorite movie character perhaps in a, a year or two from now, the way the technology is developing uh, so fast. So um, just walk us through then what else we can uh, uh, experience uh, through virtual uh, reality these days. So let me just start by telling you this data. Uh, Korea's first VR gaming center opened in 2016. Fast forward three years, now there are about approximately 200 of them across the nation. Our Arirang team actually went to one of them. This is, uh, what we're looking at here is Korea's biggest VR gaming center in downtown Seoul. The four-story station has about 21 different contents. Most of them are games. 
but there are VR comics and short movies. As far as the games are concerned, you name it, they have it. Yeah. Visitors can test their rowing technique along the virtual river with rapids, or you could show off your driving skills through a racing game. Mm -hmm. Besides uh, outdoor VR experiences like surfing and fishing that you just saw, there are also action and adventure games where you can actually become the hero. Or if you enjoy getting chills or goosebumps on your skin, a VR horror zone is prepared for you as well. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I visited uh, a couple of the VR uh, shops they have here in uh, Korea with my family, and we all had uh, a great time. And adding all these new elements, I'm sure, is going to be another reason for us to uh, go and spend our, our money in these new places. Hyangu, as always, it's a pleasure, and thank you for bringing in uh, that information today. Thank you for having me, as always. It's at this point on a Thursday where we take a quick look at some other events that are taking place across South Korea. Good morning. The autumn rainy season has begun. Late August usually brings heavy showers to the Korean peninsula, which lasts through early September. And at this time, southern parts of the country are seeing heavy showers, but the rain clouds are gradually moving out. But a heavy rain alerts still remain in place for some of the southern parts of the country. Some regions are still seeing rain coming down at 30 millimeters an hour. But most of the rain will let up by mid-afternoon. Southern regions in Jeju will see rain through this afternoon. Jeju and southern coastal regions could be quite windy though. Upper regions will be under mostly sunny skies with a few passing clouds. Daily highs will be similar to a touch lower than Wednesday. Afternoon heat is likely to stay with us for the time being, but mornings and evenings will get a lot cooler with the mercury hovering in the low 20s. And that's all the weather update for now. Okay, thank you as always to uh, Ji Hyun at the Weather Center. It seems like summer is steadily starting to wind down now. That's all we have for now, though. Stay tuned to Adirang TV. Our next newscast is at noon Korea time. So until then, goodbye.